Hi everyone, my name is Brianna Flonk and I'm a pest survey specialist for Pennsylvania and Maryland with the USDA APHIS PPQ field operations. My name is Emma Perez. I'm a plant health safeguarding specialist for the Citrus Health Response Program in um, the Lower Rio Grande Valley, Texas. And this video is part of a series of videos introducing you to the IFIS data collector application. I encourage you to watch all of the training videos we have made at least once to gain a broader understanding of the application as a whole, and then to use as reference in the future. In this video, we will cover field data collection location, If you already have gotten access to the IPIS database, are able to sign into the IDC app, and have selected and downloaded your office assignment and workbook while connected to Wi-Fi, you are ready to enter data in the field. If you need help with any of these steps, you can watch the previous videos for step-by-step -step guidance. If you have not already done so, check to make sure that your location services are turned on for the IDC app. That way the IDC app can recognize where you are and automatically enter your GPS coordinates. To see how to do this, check out Emma's awesome instructions in video three, covering how to install the app. If you would like to follow along in the IDC app user guide, navigate to the mobile data collection tools website, click on the general training documents tab, and then click on IFIS, and then the IDC mobile application user guide PDF. Field data entry is covered on page 13 through 19 of the IDC app user guide. To see an overall structure of how the data is laid out, you can go to page 26 of the IDC app user guide. This is a flowchart of how the app stores data with the office assignment and workbook, and then also how data is organized in the field, which is using location, site, activity, and then sample. If you need more help with this section, you can check out the previous video, which goes through each example and how it's laid out. If you're not sure of a specific term that we mentioned, you can go to Appendix D, which contains a glossary of terms and definitions that are specific to the IDC app. But without further ado, let's start on going through the data entry portion of the IDC app. After you get to the field, if you're still signed into the app, we recommend that you log out and log back in since the app will time out after not being used for a few minutes. You can sign out by clicking the menu button in the upper left corner and then clicking the log out button. After signing back in, you'll select your office assignment and workbook again to get to the field data entry portion. You can also click the menu button and then locations to get there faster. This is just to ensure that you know that your data is being stored to the right place. So I'm gonna click on the Citrus Health Texas office and then download the training assignment. And then I'm going to click on the training workbook, and that should be everything for where the data is stored. And again, if you're not sure of where to store your data, if you're not sure of the office assignment and workbook to select, uh, you should double check with your supervisor or data manager just to make sure. So now you'll see you're on the locations page. A location in the IDC app is defined as a contiguous piece of land and recorded as a single point, usually at the driveway or access point of the area, or a central location. As you can see, there's already a location that had been entered into the IDC app, the USDA RD Edinburgh. Now this location is yellow, which means that it hasn't been uploaded to the IPIS database yet. Once uploaded to the IPIS database, these locations will go from yellow to green. If you're revisiting a location that has already been entered into the IDC app or IPIS, you can either scroll through your locations. I only have one, so I don't really need a scroll. And if you have a lot, you can search for the location by name or address. If you're revisiting a location, either the same survey season or even a different year, all you would do is click on the location name. And then from there, you can enter additional sites. To enter a new location, click on the new button in the upper right corner. It takes a little bit for it to get your GPS coordinates and it'll bring you to a page where you can enter information pertaining to your specific location. As you can see, the locations have asterisks by them if they're required fields, as well as a red line to the left of them. So once you enter the information in the field, it'll change from a red line on the left to a green line, just like in the template line. And I'll show you that right here. 
So this new location is going to be called the USDA FSA or Farm Service Agency in Bailey County. And as you could see, the location line to the left of the name went from red to green. Next for category, I'm going to select other. And as you can see, that one also turned to green. For type, I'm going to hit orchard and pretend there's an orchard there. Now I skip the class because it's not a required field and my program never has me fill that out. But if yours did, you would want to enter something for the class. The address for this location is 111 East Avenue D. If it's northeast, west, or south, instead of writing out the whole word, you can just use the first letter as an abbreviation. You can also abbreviate street, avenue, boulevard with its abbreviation as well. You don't need to put a period after an abbreviation. It'll be able to recognize it on its own. Sometimes periods even cause uh, glitches or flag as errors in the IFAS database, so it's even easier if you just don't put a period. So I'm going to leave city blank for now. I already said the county is Bailey. Zip code is not marked as a required field, but it should be because in the IFAS database, when someone goes to check this location, it's going to be flagged as an error if it's missing a zip code. And the person that's checking the data entry will end up having to go to the Google Maps and have to research it on their own to find the zip code. So it's very helpful if you just enter it while already in the field so they don't need to do that. Now, I'm not in Texas actually, I'm in Pennsylvania, so I'm going to have to manually change the latitude and longitude coordinates. As a rule of thumb, after the decimal point, add six digits just so that it's specific enough for the location, but not too cumbersome to type in. And since I'm in the US, it's going to be a negative longitude. Make sure you have that negative or it'll also flag an error in IFAS. And it's going to be negative 102.725503. Unless otherwise told, the geo method is always going to be recreational grade. Here there's only one option, but usually there's a few. So always choose the recreational grade. Now, township range section grid area and comments are not required. I usually do not fill them out for my program, but if you're told to fill them out, you definitely should. The only section that I use is the comments section. If I see a hazard such as a bee's nest or if the property owner has a dog or even just to comment about where the general parking area is or access site is, you can put them here. And from the locations, you will be able to see sites. But as you can see right now, in the bottom right corner, sites is faded and it's not a clickable button. Since there's one field that's not filled out, that's a required field, even if you hit save, it's going to say re required field missing. Please check for any fields marked in red. So once you enter that city, which in this case is Muleshoe, Texas. Then you can actually hit save and you can see the sites button pop up on the bottom. If you're using the same GPS coordinates for your site as you are the location, you can click the create default site and it'll just copy that latitude and longitude into the site. But if you don't want to create a default site, just don't click the check mark for the create a default site. 